Next on Hawaii News Now. Dana Ireland was brutally kidnapped, brutally beaten, brutally raped, and brutally murdered by a pack of men. A pack of men which included this defendant, Albert Ian Schweitzer. We, the jury in this case, find the defendant guilty of the offense of murder in the second degree. All rise. 23 years later, Albert Ian Schweitzer has another day in court. I know I'm innocent. I had nothing to do with this. My main role is also going to be presenting the new DNA evidence. Is Ian Schweitzer excluded from every male DNA profile that was produced in this case? Yes. Not just DNA, the other forensic evidence that shows he wasn't even at the scene that day. It's 100%. There is no chance he had anything to do with it. But if he didn't, who killed Dana Ireland? Who is that person that the DNA matches? Yeah. Optimism that uh, justice will prevail in the end. Ian always tells us that Dana Ireland is his angel and she's going to show the truth. It was a horrific crime that consumed the headlines for nearly a decade. Dana Ireland, visiting family on the Big Island, was found badly injured and left for dead in a remote area of Puna. Three men were convicted of the brutal crime, but questions about the prosecution have some wondering if it was a mistake or misconduct. Live from NBC Hawaii News 8. Topping our news tonight, another setback in the Dana Ireland murder case. KGMB 9 News at 6. Big Island Circuit Judge dealt a devastating blow today to the man set to go on trial for the murder of Dana Ireland. Dana Ireland was 23 years old in 1991. She was riding a bike the afternoon of Christmas Eve in Kapoho when she was struck by a vehicle. The mangled bike was at the scene along with a shoe and clumps of blonde hair, but 911 callers could not find a rider. 30 minutes later, five miles away, Ireland was found in the bushes of a fishing trail. She was nude from the waist down, barely conscious she would die at the hospital from blood loss due to multiple traumatic injuries. She was beaten and raped in a remote Puna subdivision. Still waiting to see justice served in the Dana Ireland murder case. Years went by with dogged media coverage. The reward grew as residents demanded answers. When something horrible happens in a community, people want justice. They want someone to be accountable. Two and a half years after the crime, police got what they thought was a big break, a tip. The source was questionable, a prisoner who offered information that would lead to arrests. May 1994, Hawaii County Police were contacted by John Gonzales. Gonzales was wrapped up in a large cocaine conspiracy facing decades in prison. Instead, the drug case was closed and Gonzales only got probation. That's because he told police that his half-brother, Frank Pauline, had important information about the Ireland case. Pauline named brothers Albert Ian and Sean Schweitzer as the killers. The Schweitzers lived across the street, and the neighbors didn't get along. Pauline said he was there when the Schweitzers attacked Ireland. They started having sex with the girl, started biting her and stuff like that, and just everything else happened after that. Pauline was already in prison, serving 10 years for an unrelated sex assault and theft. But in July 1996, Pauline recanted, saying he made it all up because Gonzales asked him to make a deal so they could both get out of prison. Oh, I can make up one story. I can believe These guys don't believe me. All I care about is saving my brother's ass. And he telling me, my brother telling me, the worst can happen to you, boy, he's going to give you perjury. But perjury was not one of the crimes Pauline was indicted for on July 30th, 1997. His statements backfired, and he was charged with rape, kidnapping, and murder. And later that year, the Schweitzer brothers were too. John Gonzales stuck to the script that got the drug conspiracy charges against him dropped and testified against his half-brother, Frank Pauline. 
In the 90s, DNA technology was fairly new to the crime-solving process. Its significance still somewhat misunderstood. Shortly after the arrest, DNA samples were taken from Pauline and the Schweitzers. The Hawaii County Prosecutor's Office tested bodily fluids from the gurney sheet that was used when Dana Ireland was transported to the hospital. Also tested swabs from Ireland's rape kit. It was a surprise to law enforcement that both samples excluded Frank Pauline and the Schweitzer brothers. On October 20th, 1998, all the charges were dismissed based on the DNA results. But that didn't stop the prosecution from pursuing them. Law enforcement simply said there must have been another person involved. Rather than look at the evidence and say, you know what, we got it wrong. It doesn't match these three people. It had to be a fourth person. Other pieces of evidence also pointed away from the three men. Dental impressions did not match what investigators believed was a bite mark on the victim's chest. And it was revealed Police found no traces of blood or hair from Dana Ireland in the Volkswagen Beetle belonging to Albert Ian Schweitzer. In fact, title records show Schweitzer did not own the car until January 1992, one month after the crime was committed. Still, prosecutors kept moving forward. On May 5, 1999, with the statute of limitations days away, Police got what they considered was another break in the case. What is your full and correct name? Michael Wayne Ortiz. Inmate Michael Ortiz, another associate of Gonzales, came forward. Ortiz was in jail for theft with the Schweitzers before the charges against them were dismissed. Uh, we asked you questions about the Dana Ireland case, and you provided us with information. Who gave you that information? Ian Schweitzer. Ortiz claimed Schweitzer confessed to him. And just two weeks later, Pauline and the Schweitzers were indicted again. The brothers denied any involvement in the Ireland attack, saying on Christmas Eve 1991, they were with family. The first to go to trial, Frank Pauline. It was emotional, explosive at times, heartbreaking at others, as Dana Ireland's mother took the stand. Louise Ireland entered the Hilo courthouse, ready to relive the worst day of her life, the day her daughter Dana was violently taken from her. Something awful has happened. She said, there's a bicycle up in the road and a shoe and a hat. The horrifying details of Ireland's injuries were laid out for the jury. So I got a hold of her arm, you know, and I said, let me help you up. And she started to scream. <laughs> the pain. But the witnesses who actually linked Pauline to the crime, had questionable backgrounds, or much to gain by pointing the finger. Among them, Gonzales, the drug dealer, who got out of prison for coming forward. Shane Kobayashi, who was also released from prison early after a sex assault conviction. Sir, you have a deal, an agreement, with the government in this case, is that correct? Yes, I do. William Chong, who claimed Pauline confessed to him, but when asked, couldn't even identify Pauline in the courtroom. And where is he sitting? He's sitting in the corner with the uh, blue shirt. He okay. has the, uh, the grayish hair with the, uh, the white long sleeve shirt. The record should re will not reflect that the witness has identified the defendant. The jury was shown Dana Ireland's bike, shorts, top, underwear, and a Jimmy Z t-shirt all recovered from the scene. Not one of those items had DNA from Pauline or the Schweitzers. The sperm recovered from her clothes and the rape kit swabs came back to one unknown male. Pauline's defense attorney told the jury more than a dozen people were tested and no one matched. The person who raped Dana Ireland is not Frank Pauline. It's not Ian Schweitzer, it's not Sean Schweitzer, and it's not 13 other people. To get around the lack of scientific evidence, Deputy Prosecutor Lincoln Ashida insisted that the Jimmy Z t-shirt covered in Dana Ireland's blood belonged to Pauline. We're not afraid of that evidence, we embrace it. 
static same DNA technology. It works both ways for the defense and the prosecution. It's that same technology which places Dana Ireland's blood on Frank Pauline's t-shirt. Pauline's attorney told the jury the shirt wasn't even the right size. Still, the jury found there was enough to convict Pauline. Albert Ian Schweitzer's trial was next. He watched what happened during Pauline's trial, a quick guilty verdict. So he was surprised that prosecutors, despite that swift victory, came at him with an offer. Actually, they offered me 20 years probation. I said, no, I had nothing to do with this. Pauline is already convicted. They offered me 10 that same week, at the end of the week. These guys are offering me 10 years probation for something I didn't do. I'm going in there like, I'm gonna win. The prosecution insisted that his VW Beetle was the car that struck Ireland on her bike, then drove her badly injured body to the fishing trail where she was found, even though witnesses described seeing a pickup truck. These are the vehicles police were looking at before the tip from prisoners led them to the Schweitzers. The prosecution also used evidence presented during Frank Pauline's trial. We, the jury in this case, find the defendant guilty of the offense of murder in the second degree. After the verdict was read, Dana Ireland's father approached Schweitzer's father in court. Jerry Schweitzer still remembers the moment that hushed the packed courtroom. I don't think he really believed that there was a fair trial, because after the trial he told me he was sorry. He told his father that he had my sympathy. I think the parents are going to be ostracized and uh, they've got a heck of a lot to go through. He was right. The Schweitzer family was ostracized for many years. Bumper stickers, posters, people calling up and threatening us. We thought, well, maybe we ought to just get out of Hawaii and stuff. And, and after talking with, you know, Sean and the rest of the family, they said, you know, look like we're just trying to run away from something we didn't do. Sean Schweitzer's trial was up next, but after seeing what happened at the first two trials, he and his family had a change of heart. Sean Schweitzer was flown to the Big Island for the beginning of the end of his legal odyssey. Sean Schweitzer pleaded guilty to lesser charges, kidnapping and manslaughter to avoid trial. It that point, pretty much the writing was on the wall. He didn't want to take it. He said, no way, I'm, I'm, I'm not leaving you. You know, and I said, no. Go home to your kids. He had three babies. Part of the deal, he had to blame his brother and Frank Pauline and take a lie detector test to show he was being honest while admitting to and providing details of the crime. On March 24, 2000, a polygraph examiner from the state attorney general's office administered the test. The report shows Schweitzer did, in fact, display criteria indicative of deception when describing details of what happened. Then when Sean tried to discuss his involvement, it showed that he was being deceptive, i.e., he's lying about being involved. That could have disqualified him from pleading guilty. The polygraph report says it was routed to the prosecutor's office on April 6, 2000. But weeks later in court, Deputy Prosecutor Lincoln Ashida relayed a different message to the judge. According to the court transcripts, Ashida said Schweitzer did pass the polygraph, finding that he was not deceptive to any of the questions. Knowing, knowing that he never passed a polygraph right, which is troublesome. Once you pull that card out, that polygraph card out, and you don't have, and the DNA doesn't match anybody, the whole house comes crumbling down. Sean Schweitzer later admitted that he was lying about it all, that he had nothing to do with the violent attack on Dana Ireland, but he took the deal to avoid more time behind bars. It was a um, family decision that, you know, I don't think my family would have stayed together or you know my parents would be um as good as they are now if i was in her own there's no sense in two brothers being locked up you know 
as double financial stress, double, that would probably kill my mom, you know, I, I, and dad, you know, so. So you told him take it? Yes. Sean Schweitzer was sentenced to five years probation with credit for time served, 18 months. He still has immense guilt about making the deal and implicating his brother. Sean and his family also struggled with the stain of the case. I went through many years of disappointment and hard time to find a job, you know, not have people look at me or, or um, make snickering remarks behind my back, yeah. When my children were in elementary and intermediate, they always had other people like talk behind their back. He said it was a relief when he learned that another set of legal eyes were looking over his brother's case. In 2005, Albert Ian Schweitzer applied for a case review from the Innocence Project based in New York. The Hawaii Innocence Project was still in its infancy. Five years later, in 2010, the review started to pick up steam. University of Hawaii law students worked with attorneys, professors, and staff, sifting through old records that filled boxes and files. Hawaii County prosecutors did not stand in the way. They allowed the Innocence Project to review the case to determine if the wrong men were convicted. On January 23rd, 23 years after his conviction, Schweitzer's legal team, armed with new evidence and information, filed a motion asking the court to throw out the conviction. A hearing on the matter was set for the next day. Hours later, deputy sheriffs pulled Schweitzer from Arizona Saguaro Correctional Center and escorted him on multiple flights to get to Hilo in time for the hearing. He didn't know what was going on, but he knew he was heading home. Meanwhile, loved ones were gathering with his legal team at the Hilo Hawaiian Hotel for a restless night. It's been extremely, extremely um, difficult. Gotta wait for the final results, because I mean, we've been up and down for so long, and uh, just gotta wait for that last moment. Linda and Jerry Schweitzer recall the prison visits with their son over the years, but once he moved to Saguaro, visits dropped off. The long flight, then long drive, and Linda was battling breast cancer at the time. We only got to see him once and, you know, health issues, I couldn't get over there. That one time in the Arizona prison, her son said something to her that still stings. He said, Mom, don't come back, because I don't want to watch you walk away from me again. It was hard, sorry, <laughs> but it was hard. Schweitzer was 26 years old when he was arrested. His son was just an infant. He's now 51 years old. In those years, he missed his brother's wedding and other life-changing family events. Jeez, I haven't seen him in, you know, 20, 22 years. And um, just him not being there in our family. He's an uncle. He is missed. You know how sometimes you need that person that needs that extra something for that person, other person's life. It's, uh, you know, you don't, you don't get that back. Yeah, I've been very missed in, in my life and my, my children and grandchildren. After a long, sleepless night, the family gathered early the next morning at the courthouse, anxious to see Schweitzer, who only arrived in Hilo hours earlier. Dressed in an Aloha shirt provided by his legal team, Schweitzer smiled and greeted the attorneys when he was brought into the courtroom, his hands still cuffed with a belly chain. The new evidence was presented to the court in categories. First up, a DNA expert. Uh, my name's Nancy Din. Attorney Susan Friedman of the New York Innocence Project carefully went through each piece of evidence that multiple labs tested in recent years. Traces of sperm from the cotton swab, the stick, and the comb from Dana Ireland's rape kit. The sperm on Ireland's underwear and on the gurney sheet used to transport her to the hospital. Also, DNA recovered from the Jimmy Z t-shirt, the one the prosecution insisted belonged to Frank Pauline. 
all the items were tested again using advanced methods not available during the original trial. The technology, it, it just, it got better, it got improved in the sense that we can now see things that we couldn't see before. Previously, law enforcement said the shirt had too much of Dana Ireland's blood to test for any other DNA contributors. But scientists are now able to separate her blood from other DNA on the shirt. Sperm and sweat from the armpit were recovered. Who is the source of the sperm found on the Jimmy Z t-shirt? The source of the sperm is unknown male number one. And is that the same source of the male DNA found on the armpit cutting? Yes. Unknown male number one was the only male contributor of all the DNA evidence at the scene and on Ireland's body. Thank you. If you could state your name for the record. The next person called to the stand, an expert in tire tread evidence. He testified remotely, telling the court that Schweitzer's beetle could not have realistically made the impressions left behind at both crime scenes. Rather, he believed it was a larger vehicle, a truck, SUV, or a van, like the ones police initially looked at. Stand and raise your right hand. Dentist Adam Freeman was the last to take the stand. Ireland had an injury on her left breast that prosecutors originally said was a human bite mark. This is a picture of the wound that Freeman studied. And in your review of this pattern injury, can you please describe what you determined this pattern injury to be? Not a bite mark. I don't know what caused that. This particular case is a poster child for bad forensic sciences and where bite marks are flawed. We rest. The testimony wrapped up late in the day. Circuit Court Judge Peter Kubota then ruled. The new DNA evidence, the tire tread evidence, the bite mark evidence and Sean Schweitzer's recantation conclusively proves that in a new trial, a jury would likely reach a different verdict of acquittal. So therefore, the conviction of Albert Ian Schweitz for murder in the second degree, kidnapping, and sexual assault in the first degree is hereby vacated, and Mr. Schweitz shall be released, released immediately from custody in this courtroom. 23 years after a jury found him guilty, 25 years after he was arrested, 51-year-old Albert Ian Schweitzer was suddenly a free man. The judge wasn't done, though, speaking directly to him about the wrongful imprisonment. You got one third of your life ahead of you. You can live it being angry and resentful at the process or the people that put you there, or you can live it with a new freedom. All right, I suggest that since you have your whole family here, you hug and love your family and live a fulfilled life and make the best of the next one third of your life. Not only did the court throw out the conviction, the judge also dismissed the indictment. So Schweitzer has no criminal case pending. Sir, Mr. Schweitzer shall be released from his shackles immediately. <laughs> After the cuffs were off, Schweitzer embraced his legal team. <laughs> then, family members, some he hadn't seen in decades. His mother sobbed in his arms. <laughs> So did his sister. His son, who was just a baby when Schweitzer yeah. went to prison, was also in the courtroom. Finally get to see dad at this point. And has kept the door open for a relationship. Also waiting with a smile and open arms, brother Sean. Sean Schweitzer's attorney is now working to get his conviction vacated too. And the attorney for Frank Pauline has already filed for a dismissal posthumously. Pauline died in prison in 2015. And what about unknown male number one, the source of all the male DNA at the scene? We all want to make sure that we find the right person that did this. We've uploaded that into CODIS, the DNA profile, and we haven't gotten a hit. Who knows if he's died, if he's moved, who knows? It's, you know, over 30 years ago. You have to be patient with these processes. Uh, I'm always amazed at the number of cases where we have exonerated people, and then 10, 15, 20 years later, we find the, 
the person who did it. Hawaii County Prosecuting Attorney Keldon Waltgen said in a statement, over the last three years, his office has shared information and re-examined forensic evidence. He said, we remain committed to identifying unknown male number one and seeking justice for Dana Ireland and her ohana. Ireland's parents have both passed. Her sister Sandy lives on the East Coast, but could not be reached for comment. The court dismissed the case without prejudice, so the state can try again. Former prosecuting attorney Lincoln Ashida said in a statement that another trial, prosecution and conviction is possible against Schweitzer based upon other admissible and incriminating evidence. Ashida said because of that, he could not comment on the case. Being released was a relief, but Schweitzer says going from prisoner to free person has been a tough transition. He's working to reconnect with loved ones and just reconnect with the world. Everything, <laughs> because everything's changed. I don't even know how to use a phone. I gotta get a driver's license. I literally have to learn how to do everything again. Albert Ian Schweitzer was a nurse at the Samuel Mahalona Memorial Hospital on Kauai in the 90s. He would be close to retirement now if he hadn't been imprisoned. When he was released, he had no money, job training, or mental health treatment. Adjusting to life outside prison walls has been more of a challenge than he anticipated. He says he feels anxious most days. He cleans to calm down, and he is working to get into a daily routine. I've been told what to do just so many years, and you know, it ain't easy. Yeah, I mean, that's gotta be hard for you when you get up in the morning, right? You can eat what you want. I can eat when I want, or what I want, you know, or I don't have to eat. Schweitzer could be eligible for compensation under a law that passed in 2015 that allows exonerees to collect $50,000 per year spent in prison. But it's not an easy process to navigate. His legal team is working to get him compensated, but in the meantime... They didn't care if I was guilty or innocent. They just needed somebody to be in prison. He tries to educate others about wrongful convictions, speaking to law students and public groups on behalf of the Hawaii Innocence Project, which represented him for free. The attention is foreign to him. After being vilified by the community for so long, his story now draws a crowd, captivates an audience, and he hopes these future lawyers are listening. Not just textbook, but what the system is really about. I got robbed half my life, you know, and um, it's uh, tough. Legal experts say a wrongful conviction creates many new victims to a crime. A justice system blinded by political pressure failed Albert Ian Schweitzer and his family and stole decades of his life. It failed Dana Ireland and her family and allowed unknown male number one to get away with murder. Today, law enforcement has refocused efforts using genealogy and other DNA techniques to hopefully find the man who killed Dana Ireland. For Hawaii News Now, I'm Lynn Kawano.